In 1980, Sean Stern, along with his two brothers, Mark and Adam, formed the band Youth Brigade in Hollywood, California. Over the next 16 years, the Stern brothers would release five studio albums, including the classic Sound and Fury, which they recorded not once, but twice. But the story here isn't just about Youth Brigade. The story is about the Stern brothers and their do-it-yourself approach, which was always a hallmark of those early punk years, and the Stern brothers were no exception. This includes when they started the BYO fanzine, then BYO Records in 1981, a record label that would release music from bands like Seven Seconds, Aggression, SFNU, and many, many others. But in 1999, the Stern Brothers came up with an idea to organize what has become one of the most unique and hotly anticipated music festivals in the world, the Punk Rock Bowling and Music Festival in Las Vegas. Over the years, they've put together a world-class lineup that's included everybody from Iggy Pop to The Dam to X to Dropkick Murphys to The Stranglers to The Specials and hundreds of others. In 2020, the Punk Rock Bowling Music Festival was canceled due to COVID. They had a lineup that included the Buzzcocks, Circle Jerks, which had just reformed, Madness, Stiff Little Fingers, and more. This year, the Punk Rock Bowling Festival is back, slated for the weekend of September 24th of the 26th, with Devo, The Descendants, and The Circle Jerks, with a whole lot more being placed in the bill every single day. Now, I should point out that at the time that I recorded this interview, no FX was still part of the bill. They have since backed out following some controversial statements made by members of the band. So if you're wondering why Sean and I didn't talk about it, it's because it hadn't happened yet. Nevertheless, the Stern brothers are holding out hope that we'll all be fully vaccinated, enjoying live music, and rolling some balls and rented shoes. This is my conversation with Youth Brigade lead singer Sean Stern from the Punk Rock Bowling Music Festival in Las Vegas on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Rexy's musical podcast. I was uh, I was trying to get you guys on last year to talk about the uh, the festival. Then all hell broke loose, and you guys wound up canceling, and everybody was forced to cancel everything all at once. What was that like to try to cancel three days of a festival all in a row? That I mean, that had to just be crushing. You know, we, we just didn't really know what was happening like the rest of the world. And oh, at first, everyone was thinking, well, hopefully they'll get a handle on this and they'll start doing testing. So we're basically just trying to navigate the new world um, as best we can, listening to the science, listening to what the professionals were telling us and trying to ignore the idiots that were running things at the time. (laughs) Um, And, you know, it was just an ever changing thing every day. It was, can we do this? Uh, And if so, how are we going to do this? And we, we realized pretty soon and we were one of the early festivals to, to postpone cancel, whatever you want to call it, um, that there was just no way that we could do a festival where there's a lot of heavy drinking going on, trying to keep sort of, you know, right. reduce capacity, distancing, masking. It's just not going to happen. We can't control that. So, no, it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. I did I did interviews with uh, with Keith Morris and also uh, Jake Burns from Stiff Little Fingers, and the two of them were like, they, you, you could tell there was a, there was, I don't want to say they were defeated by it, but you could definitely tell how disappointed they were. And, you know, I, I think especially Keith, because I think, you know, he was excited about the prospect of bringing, you know, the circle jerks back. And, you know, and, and I think Jake is just like a, like a, a very nice man who's just happy to play anywhere. But uh, you could very clearly tell how, uh, how disappointed not only they were, but how everybody has been a, as a result of, of COVID and not being able to play and not being able to see your favorite bands live. It's, it's so there's a, there's a sense of optimism having guys, you know, plan something for September and and seeing the way it's starting to take shape. It's, it's you have to feel very optimistic about things right now. Yeah, we're we're very we're cautiously. I say we're cautiously optimistic. We're we're basically we've been selling tickets. We've been you know the the festival's booked completely now. Um, the festival part um, and we made an announcement today and we put we we've, we've been selling passes. We put single day tickets on sale. Today, um, we're getting a really good reaction from people because they're just, after more than a year of being stuck, you know, inside and not being able to go see bands and, and trying to to deal with all the craziness that's been happening, everybody just wants to get out. I, I know that 
amongst my family and my friends, everybody's getting vaccinated. And now we're able to, we just finally got uh, together with my family here at my house for brunch the other day for bagels and cream cheese and lox. Uh, <laughs> good for, the for, good for you. Yeah, for the first time in over a year. And uh, I, I, that's the thing why I say we're cautiously optimistic. I think, you know, over 50% of people have gotten at least one shot in this country. And, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Of course, we're now starting to see that that sort of 25, 30% of people who are against vaccines. And, yeah. you know, that's going to be the, the difficult part going forward. So let me uh, let me just uh, show you something uh, real quick here, because I want you to know that uh, I've got this little gem and I've had this thing for you know, 25 years. This is the Youth Brigade uh, Sing with California CD. I've probably had this since, I don't know, 95, 96. And the reason I own this one is I accidentally cracked uh, Sound and Fury. Uh, I put the record on my bed and put my knee on the bed and cracked the record right in half. And it was a very sad day. So uh, if there's one thing we learn on this, don't ever put your records on the bed. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've been a, I've been a fan of, uh, of you and your brothers for a, a real long time. Tell me a, a little bit about, you know, that experience. You know, you're, you're a young kid. You're coming from from uh, from Canada. You're moving to California. And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, punk rock starts to connect with you. How did it connect with you as 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 a kid? Well, me, I have three younger brothers um, and we all played music. I mean, it was a thing when we were living in Canada, my parents sent us to play piano. Um, I played when we moved to California, I played for a, a, a minute, I played flute and my brother Mark played violin in the orchestra at school. And then I picked up saxophone for a while. Um, and then I remember my grandfather was visiting from Canada and we were bored in the summertime. And he said, why don't you start playing more music? Cause we'd kind of stopped at that point. So that's when that sort of inspired me to play guitar. I was really, we were, we were heavy stoners at the time in high school and, and had been <laughs> gotten into surfing um, when we were about 13, 14 years old. And I was really into Jimi Hendrix and that was sort of the inspiration for me to play music. And we were, when we first started, we were just doing covers of the 70s rock that we grew up with. Um, it was the summer of 1977. Uh, Sex Pistols were coming to America and the big rock critic at the LA Times, Robert Hilburn, was writing about the Pistols. And that really opened my eyes. I, I wasn't super aware of what was going on yet. I was at the time 17. <laughs> and I saw, um, I heard on KMET, which is the big rock station, I heard Elvis Costello, they played My Aim is True in right. the whole album in full. And between reading about the Pistols and hearing Elvis and um, that sort of inspired me. Uh, and I started, you know, looking into what was going on with punk rock scene. And I thought, this is awesome. Because at the same time, that was happening when I went back to high school in my senior year. Um, I had my first semester English class was an existential literature class. So reading those philosophers and writers, and then the next semester that my final semester in uh, my senior year in English was all um, a Herman Hess class. Hmm. So between reading those things, um, seeing all the problems that were around in the world and seeing, you know, hearing all these new bands um, that were talking about things that I, you know, could relate to that I was going through as an adult, as an angry adolescent who was just a little too young to be a part of the hippie thing. All that was really left, I always say, all that was left of the hippies was sex and rock and roll and drugs, which there's nothing wrong with that, but there was a lot of fucked up things in the world. And, uh, you know, the hippies had tried and they did, they did help stop a war, but there was still, you know, the environment was a mess. The political system was a mess. The world was a mess. And they also left us with Journey and the Eagles. <laughs> we have them yeah. to blame for that, too. Yeah, that, there was that whole, that whole, that was an, another thing, is that the, the rock and roll music had become so complacent and so arena rock. We, I remember going to see bands, you know, they were playing in these huge arenas or even stadiums. And it was more about the, the socializing with your friends and what you were going to get stoned on during each band set and it was about the actual music and what they were saying because they weren't saying much it, it's interesting that you know unlike so a lot i mean a lot of people complained about 
you know, the seventies and how bands and music became kind of inaccessible to people like, you know, the progressive rock guys and all that stuff. And, and, uh, it, what always impressed me about, and it's kind of a cycle too, because it's it, in many ways it's coming back that whole DIY approach to music. I mean, you guys were you know really early into it. Uh, you know, the descendants were, were, were into it. DOA was into it. And it's funny because, you know, here we are now, there are more musicians and bands learning how to record on Pro Tools and distribute music themselves than maybe even ever before. And I almost wish, you know, the the Internet has now become this, this giant fanzine, but in a way there's no, the physical scene seems to be the one part that is missing. So I, I don't know how you feel about it, but it, it does seem like there's some sort of cycle going on. Um, you know, D- DIY for us was because we had no choice you, you know it wasn't as if big major labels were coming after the bands that were uh happening when when we started our band I mean the the early punk scene in LA it was a thing where people were saying well you know we want to get we have to get signed to a major label it's the only way anyone's going to hear about you and then you know Slash Records started up Danger House Records started up and that was sort of we could see from Stiff and um in England and um, some of these smaller labels that you didn't have to sit around and wait for a major label to sign you, that you could do it on your own. And when we decided to put out our own records, we just went and honestly, we went down to the place, to the pressing plant and just started asking the guy questions. And he told us, this is what you do. You know, this is how it's done. And we met a lot of those people, the, the guy, the, the German guy who ran the label company who made the labels for almost every record in any independent records that were being pressed in LA and same thing with the pressing plants our, our pressing plant the the one we worked with the longest Bill Smith custom records just finally Kevin the son of Bill he finally closed it down about three four years ago really uh, yep yeah so you know we we just figured it out and that it was out of necessity the same thing with with putting on shows that's how we became promoters it was just we want to play a show and the clubs don't want to have anything to do with punk rock so we ran out of hall you know, and we figured out how to do it. We learned by doing. Um, that's what DIY was then. Now, I, I think the digital revolution has been awesome in a lot of respects because it, it used to be that if you were someone who was creative, but you didn't have a contact with someone who had money because it cost a decent amount of money to make a rec- record, you'd, you know, you'd start your garage band and you'd end in the garage, you know. A lot, lots of bands did that. Now people can make music and put it out on the internet, which is wonderful. It's also not so wonderful because there's nothing that um, there's no bullshit detector. Um, <laughs> and so you've got a lot of really mediocre stuff out there. Yeah. Or worse. Yeah. And it, 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 it's also funny because if you talk to other people who were, you know, file sharing is how you put together a record during COVID. It's, you know, like, you know, a band isn't even together. They're just, it's just, they're emailing each other files and they play along and it's like, well, where is the band in all of this? It's not, it's not even a band. It's just, you know, someone, you know, taking a few hours out of their day to, to put together a drum part or, you know, to, you know, to sing a backup vocal or something. It's, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's very, very weird, but on the other hand, it doesn't take a whole hell of a lot of money to put together mu- music like that. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely socializes the, the idea of, of, of making, music um collaborating with people and there's a lot of great things to that the 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 thing that's missing um is what you were saying the physical and there is a thing in music if you're a musician a lot of people don't really understand it but you know if you most people may not hear it i notice it when people do mashups you know Mm. they go oh see this song here i'm gonna mix this song on top of this song see how they work together no, most of them don't work together at all. If you know anything about beats, it's terrible. But it, it's just, in, it, it blows my mind that people are like, that's so cool. They're almost the same. They just work on top of each other. No, they're terrible. They don't work at all. And music, musicians, you know, you, when you play together, you, you get a beat, you know, working together. There's a feel that you have. It's the whole jam thing. You yeah. Know? That, that, you miss that when you have uh, socially distanced music making. So the DIY thing, you know, certainly uh, continues with you and your brother, you know, putting together this this festival. Isn't it like, a, I think this is the 22nd year? Yeah, Punk Rock Rolling was, I guess it's 22, well, officially, because we missed, I guess we missed 21. 
You counted it. You counted anyway. You don't stop aging simply because you yeah. missed your birthday party. So that one was canceled. <laughs> but as but as far as you know how this begins, I mean, you know, this has become one of the most unique and anticipated events in Vegas every year, especially for people who love that genre of music, punk rock, and you know other alternative music. How did it start between you and your brother? What was the the impetus between putting together punk rock? And, and then bowling. Were you guys big bowlers or? Um, no, we're not. I mean, <laughs> when we were in high school, we used to do, we used to put on parties because we, you know, we, we, we recognized early on, I'm not a huge fan of capitalism, but I deal with the reality of that's the world we live in. And when we started getting stoned, we realized, well, why do I want to buy <laughs> weed and spend money when I could just buy a bunch of weed, sell it to my friends and then smoke for free? You know, that, that's sort of been the impetus for most of the business transactions that we've done in our lives. And so when we started playing music as a cover band, um, we realized well, we'll put on a party at somebody's house. We'll bring the weed or whatever drugs we had, get some beer, charge an entrance fee, have bands play. And that's how we got into the idea of promoting. Um, so throwing parties is something we've been doing since we were in high school um, for fun. And, one of the guys that was working at our label at BYO, he had heard that Fat Records was doing a league up in San Francisco with them and, you know, all the bands on their label and their friends. And he said, we should do that. Little did we know, this guy's name's Andre. He's from Dalton, Mass. And he used to do a, a fanzine out there um, whose name escapes me right now. But that's how we knew him. And he said, I'm moving to LA. And so we said, sure, come and work here. And he had heard about the, the bowling. And he said, we should do a a bowling league like that. So we did one in Santa Monica. He didn't tell us that he's a 200 plus average bowler, <laughs> which was great. So he was on our team. He's been the ace of our team ever since, which is why we managed to win several um, championships, but not as many as Epitaph. Yeah. Well, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with stacking the deck. Nothing wrong yeah. with that at all. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, when we did the league, it, it was really successful. I mean, Epitaph was, had a team. We had teams, a bunch of different labels, a bunch of different bands. And then, you know, my brother Mark and I, we loved to gamble. And we thought this would make a great party in Las Vegas. And that's how Punk Rock Bowling was started, because it really was just a party. It started off, we were doing it on President's Day weekend, because in February, most bands in those days weren't touring. It's too cold. So we thought, okay, so now we can have a party in Vegas for all our friends and bands and at the other labels. And that's what it was. It, it wasn't exclusive, but it was pretty much you had to know somebody because within the first two years, it would sell out so quickly and people wanted to come and we just couldn't let everybody in. So we would just say, you got to know somebody. Um, but we would just have a show Friday night to kick things off. Um, and then we bowl Saturday and we bowl Sunday and we have a, an awards party on Sunday where everybody <laughs> would, people were pretty much drunk the entire weekend. And I mean, you know, you got 200 punk rock bowlers, uh, you know, dress, people would dress up cause there was four people per team. Uh, and then <laughs> you know, we'd give away Andre started working in the porn industry after he left BYO. So he had all these crazy, he'd be bringing the most ridiculously crazy porn. For the losing team, the losing team, <laughs> you know, midget porn or I don't know, it was just the weirdest stuff. I don't know where he got. The stuff <laughs> so it was just you know debauchery, and it it didn't develop into a full fledged actual music festival until 2010, when one a guy came to us from a casino called Sunset Station, and he said, "You got to come check out my state of the art bowling alley." And we said, "You know, we don't really care. It's just for fun." <laughs> But we'll come look at it. And we went and we looked at it and we said, yeah, nice bowling lanes, but we're at Sam's Town and they treat us nice. And he's all, well, I also have this amphitheater out here, which you're free to use. And we said, whoa, amphitheater. <laughs> now we have shows all weekend, we're in. So that's how it started that it became a festival. Needless to say, the place was so packed and we sold out there. They only had like 300 rooms at that place. That yeah. sold out. Like we were... We took over motels around the place, and then we moved downtown after that. Now that's when it really just blew up. Who would you say was your first big get as far as a band goes at, at the festival? Where you said, "Okay, wow, that 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 even exceeded our expectations that we could get you know these guys to play." Um, I think you know all all the punk bands we're friends with. So you know, having Rancid, No Effects, and Bad Religion, all that is it, it's not that it's not a big deal, but 
they're our friends. So right. that was, a, we got Devo and that was a pretty big thing for us because we, my bro, Mark and I saw Devo at the Starwood in 1979. And I wow. was, we were blown away. And I remember we went and saw them. They were, they were sort of, it wasn't even a reunion, but they didn't play that much, but it was probably about 2009, 10, 11, something like that. They were playing at the race truck. There was a race, there used to be a racetrack by the forum, Santa, Santa Ana or Santa Anita. And um, they played there and we were like, wow, they're so, they're still great. Yeah. So we got them to play. And I remember a lot of people were like, they're not punk rock. And we said, you have no idea. You have no <laughs> idea. They're one of the most punk rock bands ever. Their whole devolution theory and all that. And we saw them, you know, when they were starting out and everyone in the audience was singing along we told we told everybody you'll see when you see them and now we got them playing again this year which we're really stoked about now. i'm looking at the this year's updated list and, and uh there's some names that are on just over the last uh, day or so i don't it's there's like there's a couple new ones here that, that that i had not yet seen like all english beats uh what else did i see gorilla biscuits and uh youth brigade what how'd you get those guys <laughs> Yeah, I, I, every year people want us to get them, and it's difficult because the drummer he <laughs> a lot at the festival, and he can't play. He's destroyed by you know the, the second day. So you know, last year you had, you know, and obviously you know with the the, the cancellations of a pretty big deal, but you had the Buzzcocks, Madness, Cox Bar, uh, the Addicts were were there, Stiff Little Fingers. Obviously, you know with the, with the with the cancellation. In, in some ways, the ship may have sailed on some of those bands. When that happens, are you still in touch with them? Did you try asking them back for this year? How did how did that work? Yeah, we yeah. We, like I said, most of the bands are friends of ours, people we've known for a long time. Um, it was going to be it was a really big deal to get Madness because you know Mark books all the bands. He's way more diplomatic than I am. I, I can't deal with the agents and you know. <laughs> it's, it's not me. I, I'm the one that pays, so I, I deal with the money. And when I pay them, I, I'm not. <laughs> I get to deal with that. That's awesome. but, you, you don't have to be as diplomatic when you're the one writing the check. Uh-uh. No. So, so madness we've been trying to get for many years. I, I mean, probably the set. The, the other big coup was when he got D, uh, when he got Iggy Pop a few years ago. That was pretty amazing. Like but we had, we had the specials uh, in 2019, and they were awesome. I mean, for us, a lot of people, you know try to define what punk rock is i i don't know what it is you know but ska is a super important part of it it, it always has been i mean the two-tone uh music of the you know late 70s and early 80s was a big influence on us um at the yeah. time and i think mm -hmm. on all these all these bands i mean you listen to how much sort of reggae ska is influenced in the clash and absolutely we're, we're gonna have madness in 2022 that i the th the thing for this year is that because of COVID making everything so uncertain and especially travel, there's really not a lot of bands coming from out of the country because we just, they didn't know and we didn't know and we didn't want to put a situation where a band would have to cancel. At the last Plus, I mean, you're still talking about September and it's, I think even people who are buying tickets, you know, they'll buy the tickets just to, to, to claim them or have them or, you know, book the hotel rooms. But there's a lot that we just don't know between, you know, now and the time the festival begins in, in, in late September. So I, I would imagine that if if you're a band and you want to make the commitment to travel, that's going to be really, really hard to do with so much unknown. Yeah. And that's that's why Madness, you know, we talked to them and they wanted to come back and then they realized it's just too up in the air. We're just going to wait for 2022. And, you know, we're not we're we're not talking about youngsters in a lot of these bands anymore. Right. <laughs> No, no, you're not. And even some of them are even in their seventies. Iggy's, I think, seventy-two or seventy-three now. So didn't you? And you had the uh, the Stranglers uh... in 2019. They played. They were amazing. And sadly, uh, uh, the keyboard player, what's his name, Dave? Dave uh, Greenberg. Yeah. Dave, yeah, yeah. He died from COVID. Yeah, I know. The bass player from uh, who was playing with Cockney Rejects also passed away from COVID. Last really? Year. Wow. It, it, it's so unfortunate on a lot of different levels, and and I would you know, never mind just the, the you know the the loss of life, but you know for and, and you know people getting sick, but you know just just the way we've had to kind of you know morph the way we live, and you know for a guy like you whose you know career has been centered around music, and all of a sudden it's just you know tumbleweeds everywhere, 
you kind of have to find your own ways of uh, of occupying your time. What what have you been doing during COVID other than just you know trying to formulate uh, the festival? Well, I live here in Venice, and uh, I I'm a pretty avid gardener, and I grow vegetables. So it was great because I had the whole summer of you know working in my garden. That was that was pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. And like everybody else, you know, just starting to do things. My my girlfriend's from Italy, so we. She, she, she actually kept working. She does art conservation and she was working on the Watts Tower. So she was able to do that because that's a socially distanced job. There's only one or two other people on that job. Um, so, you know, we just, we just hung out here, um, you know, didn't do a whole hell of a lot like everybody else. I'm lucky that I can stay inside and I don't have to go out to a job and to, to, to get by. Um, I feel bad for the people that, you know, actually had to go out or, or were living, t- risking their lives every day. Um, that, it's an amazing thing that so many people were out there doing this every day and, yeah. and re- really taking that, that, that chance. It's, it's, it's just a, such an incredibly weird lifetime <laughs> event, you know? Yeah, I know. Most, but- it, it, it's the biggest, so- it's the biggest social experiment we'll, we'll ever go through in our lives. That's, that's for sure. Do you anticipate any more announcements as far as, you know, who gets booked or is this right now pretty much the way it's going to look? Um, that's the lineup for the actual festival. Then we do these club shows late at night mm-hmm. um, because normally, because we normally do this on the three day Memorial day weekend, it's a little bit bigger because Monday is a holiday and we have, we do the festival Saturday, Sunday, Monday and Friday come people come in and we kick off with club shows Friday night and then Saturday, Sunday, and even, a couple Monday night after the festival's over. So we don't have that Monday. So we're, we're cutting things back a little bit, but we're still three days of festival and we're going to have Friday, Saturday and Sunday night club shows. So that we're waiting now, of course, to hear about the venues, you know, we have a couple that are outside, but several of them are indoor. Um, they range in capacity from 250 to 1500 people. Yeah. Uh, is, are there occupancy issues? in nevada now that you may be facing then i i don't think it's an occupancy issue it's just a matter of i mean if we're going to do an outdoor festival we should we should have no problem doing outdoor club shows right it's the indoor ones that are up up in the air and you know we're pretty much going to follow the guidelines of the cdc and the and the nevada health department um, the clark county health department the state health department uh whatever they ask us to do is what we're going to do um I'm of the mind that there'll be enough people vaccinated plus people who've had COVID that will be at herd immunity. We should, I, I, I think that shouldn't be a problem. Um, I don't, like I said earlier, I don't see us doing a festival if we have to limit capacity. I mean, economically we can't, we, right. we work on a sellout, you know, um, if we had to do 50% capacity, we couldn't do it. We couldn't afford to pay the bills. We would, it would be a losing proposition. Right. And again, like I said, there, this is such a heavy drinking crowd. We can't <laughs> enforce socially distancing and wearing a mask. So I'm just, our, our philosophy is enough people will be vaccinated that you shouldn't have to worry about COVID. Perfect. You'll be able to go out and have a, have a good time. If, you know, I've, I've had people say, well, you know, you can take people's temperatures and all that. I don't know, but if you're vaccinated, what's the what's point? What's the point? Right. Exactly. Well, it's, you know, it's, it sounds like a, uh, like so much fun and I've been, I've been watching, you know, come from afar, uh, for the last couple of years of what you guys put together. And every year I say, Jesus, I gotta, I gotta find my way out there. Cause it sounds hey, like you, so goddamn much fun. So, so you, even old guys like us, uh, yes, it, it would be a, a lot of fun to be out there. So, uh, Sean, I really appreciate you, 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 you joining me today. I, I am looking forward to, to coming out and, uh, and spending some time and causing real damage to this place. Definitely. We look forward to having you. Awesome. Sean, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Take care. You too. To find out more about the Punk Rock Music and Bowling Festival, you should check out their website at punkrockbowling.com. And let me know what you think of the show. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email me anytime at baxatrock102.com. And thanks, as always, for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.